Good morning. Or as we say at the harbor, good morning. We like to add T's in our words. So this morning, I will be sharing a message titled, Out of the Cave and Into the City. I am super stoked about that. I'm just, oh, okay, Chastity Rogers is watching, which means that my Harbor family is watching. Okay, perfect. So I can start. All righty, let me turn these comments. Okay, sweet. Alrighty, so out of the cave and into the city, I'm going to be reading from Mark 5 this morning. I'll be also reading from the NIV version of the Bible and above this story that we are going to read, which starts at Mark 5 verse 1, my Bible titles it, Jesus Restores a Demon-Possessed Man. So if you're anything like me, you're like, what? That, that sounds kind of crazy, but Really, I just love this story so much because uh, it's the testimony of one of the scariest men in the Bible. And I say that he's one of the scariest men in the Bible because who else have you read about in this, in this amazing book that was possessed by, uh, as scripture says, a legion of demons? That's kind of, uh, that's beyond scary. And it, what's cool is that although this man is literally possessed by his issues uh, far more than anyone else I've read, it's so cool to see like the father's heart towards him and how even in his mess, the Lord saw him as a son. And just like us, even in our craziness and even in our reckless behavior, the Lord, he would look down on us and he would not just see us for all of our just craziness, but he would see us as daughters and as sons. And I actually heard uh, Julie Ballard the other day, she said, even in your mess, God was speaking destiny over you. And that's just so overwhelming to know that we have a father that loves us so much that he doesn't just see us for who we are, but he also sees us for who we are becoming. And you know, I think of David that he, God called Samuel to anoint David as the king of Israel, even while David was still a shepherd. So that's just so amazing that the Lord sees us for who we're becoming. And I see the same thing in this story in Mark 5. So I'm just going to read straight from the scriptures. And I warn you ahead of time, there's a good chance, or I'll tell you for sure, that I will stop a few different times as I read. And I'll just give you a little bit of commentary on a few of these things. And uh, my, my hope and my heart and my prayer is that your heart will be encouraged as I share how I feel as if the Lord has illuminated these scriptures to me. So I'm going to start out by praying. All right. So, Father, it is, just, it is just such a joy to know you and to be able to, to see you as our creator and as our father and as our friend. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that, that your word will fall on good soil within our hearts so that it may grow and produce a crop. And God, I just pray that, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us and change us from the power of your holy scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Or as I like to say, A to the men, men, right? That's good. You got to add a little bit of sass in it, right? All right, so Mark 5. Starting with verse 1 says, and this is uh, talking about Jesus and the disciples. So this is he and his little posse. So it says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. So I'm going to pause right there just to give you a little bit of insight to this. Um, this man literally lived in these tombs. And tombs are not meant to live in at all. And in your version of the Bible, it may say caves. So we're actually going to replace that word tombs with caves just because it kind of goes with what I felt the Lord speak to me. But tombs, caves, same thing. They are, they're dark, they're damp, they're lonely, they're isolated, and they're dead. So he literally lived in a cave. He was like a caveman. 
So it says in verse 3, This man lived in the tombs or the caves. And no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. That's, that's pretty sad. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I'm going to pause right there again. <laughs> Did you notice that the moment, the moment that Jesus shows up on this scene, Everything in heaven and on earth has to bow to him. So this man is, is in his tombs being tortured night and day by, by, by his possession. And the moment that Jesus rolls up with his crew in this little boat, the second that Jesus' perfect little Jesus feet touch that sand, I just imagine this echo of like power that just goes throughout the land. And everything in heaven and on earth and every impure spirit and every problem, every issue, every addiction that has possessed this man in that moment had to bow to Jesus. That is the power, that is the absolute power of God that went throughout that land. And I can tell you now that everything within you, every good thing, every bad thing, everything that's in the natural, everything that's in the spirit realm, everything has to bow to Jesus. That is the power of God, that this man can be stuck in those tombs for days, nights, years. And the moment that Jesus Christ shows up, everything inside of him finds himself at the feet of Jesus. That is power. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Remember, he was possessed by a legion of demons. And I'm at full strength, a Roman legion actually numbered 6,000 men. Just a little side note. For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. This is a turn of events. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go unto them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. <laughs> Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I'm going to pause right there. I just think, um, you know, you can't help but, like, laugh at this because, I mean, who, who would have, who, who comes up with this stuff? No one. Like, this is the Bible for you. And I just think that Jesus thought that this had to have been funny. I mean, he showed up and caused a scene. And that just goes to show that Jesus will cause a scene for your freedom. I don't care how crazy it looks. I don't care um, how, how nuts these people thought the disciples and Jesus were. Guess what? Jesus doesn't care what people think, and he doesn't care how it looks. Whatever it takes to save you and to free you, he's going to do it. And I just imagine that, that he kind of thought that this was a little funny, because I think it is too. And then it goes on to say, those, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Verse 17, then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, this is my favorite part, as Jesus was getting into the boat, 
the man who had been demon-possessed. He begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So when the man went away, so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. The end. That's a good ending. And who would have thought, who would have thought that anyone who was that bad off, someone who was quote unquote too far gone, who would have ever thought that they could ever be restored back to their right mind? Who would have thought that this man of all people could have ever had a second chance at life? Well, Jesus thought so, and he came after him. And my initial reaction after reading this story was, Lord, thank you for coming after me like you came after this guy. Thank you, Lord, that you called me out of my cave just as you called this man out of his cave. So remember, what are caves? Caves are where you hide. How many of us have, have this tendency to hide? Well, it's basically everyone. It's within our human nature to hide when we know that we've done wrong or when we know that we've done wrong against God. It goes all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. What did they do when they knew that they had sinned? They hid. They hid. But we can't hide from Jesus, guys. And no matter what cave you have found yourself in, for you it may be the cave of addiction, for others it may be the cave of anger, or it may be the cave of depression. That's a dark, lonely cave. For others it may be the cave of insecurity or the cave of unworthiness. Whatever cave you have found yourself backed into and stuck inside of, I am here this morning to encourage you that God is calling you out of your cave. He's calling you out of those dark, dead places, and he is commissioning you into a city. And you say, Lexi, well, why is he sending me into a city? Well, let's look at this story. What did Jesus do? He sent this man into a city. And like I said, this was my favorite part of the story because... I don't know about you, but when, when I read the scriptures, I see the story play out in my mind. And I'm just going to kind of interpret it Lexi style for you. But I just imagine this man who, who has lost himself for a long time. He was unable to even think. He had no ability to even think his own thoughts. He was literally possessed by his problems and by his issues and by spiritual forces. And for the first time in a long time, he had found freedom. For the first time in a long time, he had felt accepted. And for the first time in a long time, he felt understood. He was no longer embarrassed or hiding, but he was able to fully be himself for the first time in so long. And, uh, and I just imagine that, that he and the disciples, that they're just celebrating and they're just like, wow, did you see that? Like, you know, what's your name? Tell us about you. Like, how did you end up here? And I just imagine that they're all celebrating and they're just hanging out. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and he leaves. And the disciples are like, okay, we got to go, you know. And, and, and as they leave, they get into the boat. And, and this man, this, this man that had been saved, he's, he turns around and, and, he, and he panics because he's like, well, please, you know, don't leave. Please don't leave me. Let me, can I go with you, Jesus? Let me go with you, please. And Jesus says, no. You can't come with us. And, and in his heart, he's confused because he thinks to himself, why can't I go with you? You know, you understand me. For the first time ever, I feel loved and accepted. Let me go with you. Whoever you are, let me go with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, son, you can't come with us because I am calling you into the city. 
you can't come with us where we're going because I have a certain place for you and I have a certain destination for you. And I'm going to send you into that city because I need you to go tell all of those people how God has saved you and how he has had mercy on you. And in response, I just imagine that this man, his response is, please, please don't make me go. Please don't make me go there. Those people, they won't understand me. I imagine he, he thought to himself, please don't make me go. I'm, I'm so embarrassed of what I have done. I am so ashamed of what I've done, Jesus. Please don't make me face those people. Don't make me face my family and friends. Don't make me face them. And Jesus in response says, no, you have to go. But don't worry because I will be with you. And that just touches my heart so deeply because, you know, as, as bad as we want to, as bad as we want to do the comfortable thing, as bad as we want to do the easy thing, God always calls us into something that is challenging. And each and every one of us this morning has a city that is awaiting us that God has commissioned us to. God has a certain assignment for you in this season of your life as he is calling us out of our caves. You know, just getting practical. A lot of us have been in quarantine for a long time. And if you're anything like me, you kind of started to like it. You know, a lot of people were, were ready to get up and at it and get out of the house and things like that. But, you know, there's a chance that there are some people out there that, um, that kind of... Uh, were able to grow accustomed to just being at home and staying in their quote unquote cave. But now God is just uh, calling us out of lockdown and he's calling us out of these caves and he's saying, no, you can't stay there because I have a city that is awaiting you. And what are cities? Cities are full of light and they're full of life as opposed to caves that are dark and isolated and lonely. He's calling us into those cities. And for many of us that are, that are in the recovery community, we have felt this call on our hearts to go into the city. Why? Because um, the city is where you get back on your feet. The city is where you uh, start to pay your probation fees and your district court fines. And the city is where you get your driver's license back. The city is where you start to be able to visit your kids and, and where you're able to get a job and, and like do your community service and actually become a productive member of society. The city is where we get back on track and we do what we know that God has called us to do. Unfortunately, the city is oftentimes intimidating for us. It's oftentimes intimidating because for many of us, all we've ever known is the cave. All we've ever known is how to hide and how to get by. All we've ever known is, is cave clothes and cave lingo. You know, I'm convinced that a lot, a lot of the reason why people stay in the projects and why people stay in addiction is because they don't think that they're good enough or smart enough for the quote unquote city because they've never known it. It's too intimidating. Some people think, well, the city is just for the educated or the city is just for the people that have money. I'm better off to just stay in the caves because that's all I've ever known. And for some people, you've actually become good at living in the caves. Some of us are pretty good at being cavemen and cavewomen. But this morning, God's calling us out of those caves, and he is commissioning us into the city. And I just want to encourage anyone that's out there that, that may feel as if they are not good enough or pretty enough for the city. You know, the good news is, is that as, as you decide to put your feet to faith, and as you decide to answer the call of God, to enter into the new lifestyle that God has called you to, the good news is, is that God will send you people. I, I am a testimony to that, that, that God has just surrounded me with, with people that have taught me what it looks like to live in the city. 
it's so intimidating because you feel like you're going into it alone and you think to yourself, well, I don't have the right clothes. I don't have the right education. I don't even know how to live in the city. All I've ever known is welfare. All I've ever known is the projects. All I've ever known is how to get by. All I've ever known is poverty. But God will send you people. It says in Psalm 16, that Psalm 16, 11, that he will show us, it, David wrote, he said, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence. So Jesus will show you the way. He, in fact, is the way. He will show you the way of, of how to live and how to operate and how to succeed within this new life that God is calling you to. Don't stop halfway just because you're concerned about how to do it. Go back to school. Apply for the job. Finish the program. Do whatever it is that you have to do to go forward because I, I assure you God will send you people and he will surround you with that cloud of witnesses. It's such an amazing thing. But the key to this whole story, if you want to succeed and live out the same testimony that this man lived out, the key to that is that God will set you free from the caves, but it is your own choice to go into the city. I'm going to read that again. God will set you free from the caves, but it is your own choice to go into the city. Guys, God will set you free from addiction. He will set you free from your circumstances. He will set you free from your grief, but it is your own choice. It takes your own two feet and your own free will to march on into that city. You know, a lot of us have this false hope or false expectation that God will just supernaturally make everything work out. And as bad as I want to say that that will happen, at the end of the day, we have our own choices we have to make. And we have to put our feet to faith and we have to fulfill our own responsibilities. God will set us free, but it is our own choice to move forward. It's the same thing with this example. God will deliver you from the cave of fear. But it's your choice to walk in the freedom of being fearless. It's your own choice. It's your own choice. You know, what I'm, sa what I'm saying is, is that God will deliver us, but it's our own choice to walk in freedom. An example that I have for that is, is this particular man, he could have easily, you know, Jesus could have easily uh, saved him, set him free, and left him in his right mind. And this man could have just stayed and lingered around the caves. He could have stayed in that exact same location and never went into the city. You know, and, I, and I've, I've seen that a lot of people tend to do that. That God will set them free. God will change them from the inside out. But they, but they never fully walk out the plan that God has for them in the fact that they never pursue the fullness of, that God has available for them. You know, God has called us to a full and an abundant life, but we tend to just stay and linger around the caves because that's what's comfortable. But guys, it's very, very dangerous to linger around the caves. And what I mean by that, I'm just going to be practical. There are tons of people that think that they can change, but then continue to hang around the same, the same toxic people. There are some individuals that God will save and change, but yet they always end up right back where they started because they remain in the same unhealthy relationships. They continue to hang out with the same people. They continue to kick it at the same places. There are some people that think that after they get saved or set free from addiction that they can go and minister or witness to the individuals that they used to get high with or, or that they used to run around with. And I'm sorry, I know that you love those people to a certain extent, but it's not your job to save them. It's not your job to be their Christ. Only Jesus can do that. And guys, you are not called to a bar, and you are not called to a trap house to witness. You are called to the city, okay? So the thing is, is for me, if I were to continue to hang around, quote unquote, the caves that I came from, Sooner or later, someone will mistake me as a cave woman and they will invite me back in and I will be right back 
where I started. You know, the, the saying goes, if you hang around a barber shop long enough, you will get a haircut. I'm not looking to get any haircuts. I am looking to go into the city. I don't wanna be sucked back into that same trap that I have worked my way out of. No, God has not called me to the same people. God has not called me to the same culture that he has delivered me from. He has commissioned me and assigned me to this new city that he has in store for me. Guys, your impact for the kingdom, if you're looking to help people, and chances are that you are, if you are looking to help people or make a difference in the world, your impact will be far, far greater when you operate under the destiny that God has written on your, on, on your life as opposed to the destiny that you are trying to write on your own life. Let me say that again. You will make a far greater impact for the kingdom of God if you pursue the purposes of God on your life rather than, say, the purposes of your own self on your life. That's really good. I love that. I love that so much. So he'll set you free from the chains that held you in the caves, but it's you that has to choose to march on into that city. And you may say, well, Lexi, there are people that I love that are in those caves. There are people that I deeply and dearly love that are still in those caves and I can't leave the cave without them. And I don't want to treat that lightly because I know that, that that's heart stuff. You know, that's sacred. That's sacred. Those, those connections that, you've, that you have formed in your life, those are sacred. So I never want to take that lightly that I know that it hurts. But guys, with great sacrifice comes great blessing. The price of growth is discomfort. There is a good chance that you will have to leave certain individuals behind so that you can move forward into what God is calling you into. And I know that it is sacrifice, but the word says in Hebrews 11 that, that he blesses those who, who earnestly seek him. I promise God has a rescue mission for that particular person that you feel like you can't live without. You're not the only one that has a rescue plan on their life. It's everyone else that's still in the caves. But like I said, you're not called to be their Christ. That's Jesus's job. So leave the people where they are and trust that God has a plan for them, that you can't save them, but God can. And I promise the greatest way that you can minister to someone that is still in the cave is by walking out your new lifestyle. It's not about what you can say to them. It's not about how you can convince them to stop doing what they're doing. But the greatest thing, the greatest thing that can minister to someone that is still in a cave is by walking out the fruitful, productive, joy-filled lifestyle that God has called you to. Just keep doing your thing. And that will speak louder than any sermon. Speak louder than any, any sermon. So he calls us out of the cave and he invites us into the city. And you know, I just think it's so awesome because for this particular man, it wasn't just one city, but the word says that he called him into the Decapolis and the Decapolis was made up of 10 cities. 10 cities. So that just goes to show that for every one cave you leave behind, the Lord's got 10 cities for you. For every one thing that you have to give up, God always blesses you with such an abundant more. It's like the story of Job. He lost everything and got it all twice back. Listen, God is a rebuilder. He is a rebuilder of your life. Just this morning, I was meditating and reflecting on how the Lord has literally rebuilt my life. And it has turned into something that I, that I never, never could have imagined. It's, it's overwhelming how the Lord has rebuilt my life and, and how he has taken certain broken pieces and certain broken relationships that, I, that, that were so just like heart, heartfelt and how he has rebuilt those to where Christ has become the center of them and just put them into this new life for me. It's incredible, but it hasn't been without sacrifice. It hasn't been without sacrifice. And as I just think deeper about this story, you know, my heart also goes out to um, the, the family of this man. You know, 
this man had to be someone's son. This man had to be someone's son. And, and I think about uh, this man and, and I imagine that he, and this is my imagination, right? And I, and I just go from that from my heart, but I imagine that there was a good chance that he had a mama. And there's a good chance that that mama was determined to save this man, that she wanted to help him in whatever way she could. And the reason why I think that is because it says in verse four that he had often been chained hand and foot but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. That very well could have been his mom marching up to that mountain, going into that cave and trying to grab a hold of him and say, son, we're gonna get you some help. I gotta chain you down and I'm gonna take you somewhere where you can get some help. But it says that he would continue to break the chains and that he could not be held down his mom couldn't even save him. His family couldn't even save him. And I know um, just being in recovery ministry that there are a lot of fierce mamas out there. There are a lot of fierce parents out there that will march on into that cave themselves and grab their child out of that cave. And that is incredible. My mom has been there. Uh, it, she's been there and I, I just know the pain that that is that is within going into your child's cave to save your child but the scripture said that that he tore his chains and he broke the irons on his feet and you know i imagine even um maybe he had a wife that would go up there at times to try and just save him you know and try and talk him down and be like what's going on like how can i help you there's a chance that he had kids you know, there's a chance that he had children that were waiting for their dad to come home. And, you know, I, I read it right here in verse 6, verse 5, it says, Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out. He would cry out and cut himself with stones. Chances are there were people in that nearby town that would hear him cry out. Well, why would you say that? Because how why else would it how else would this be written if someone had not said it and heard it themselves? People would hear this man cry out from the town. I mean, who's to say that his kids weren't just, you know, packing their bags headed to school one day and and heard some loud voice from the hills and and they were like, "That's my dad." And they had to hear their dad crying out from the cave. And I believe that our families and our friends have often heard us crying out from the cave. You know, um, oftentimes, you know, a big thing at the Harbor Home are mug shots. You know, like before, uh, before we take a girl in, we sometimes try and look them up. And, and oftentimes, you know, especially if they're coming out of jail, we happen to see their mug shots. You know, and you know that there's times that uh, that people have made it in the newspaper who there are sometimes people who have made it on the news because of their, you know, their illegal acts. And in any time I see things like that, mug shots, newspaper articles, um, things of that sort, I don't see criminal behavior. I see people crying out from the cave. There are people crying out from the cave and they may not realize it, but that's what they're doing. You know, I was, I was sitting here at the house uh, yesterday and Jenna Hefner, um, one of our phase two girls that just completed her classes, we were sitting there talking and we were reminiscing on, on when, when all of her stuff came to an end. And she said that when, when the cops um, came to her home to arrest her, that uh, while she was laying on the ground getting handcuffed, she said, what took y'all so long? Jenna was crying out from the cave, hoping deep within her soul that someone would come after her. And there was someone that came after her, and his name was Jesus. Jenna was not arrested, but she was rescued. 2 Samuel twenty two twenty 20 says that he rescued me because he delighted in me. I want you to know this morning, guys, that the Lord hears you crying out from the cave. Whether, whether it is a suicide attempt, whether it is getting arrested, whether it may just even be your heartfelt 
cry. It may be your heartfelt prayers that you pray while you're alone, you know, that, that you just know, you just know that those prayers have to be answered, you know. The Lord hears you crying out from the cave, and he has sent his one and only son to come and die on a cross so that we would have a chance at living a fulfilled life and living eternity in heaven with him. God has heard your cries from the cave and I assure you that he has a plan. He has a plan for your life and he has a plan for your circumstances. And just like he sent Jesus to come after this man, he has sent Jesus to come after us and to hear our cries from the cave. That is so good. You know, um, when I think about being stuck in these caves, and I'm about to wrap this up because I've got my little timer here, and, and I am determined to not go over too much of 30 minutes. But when I when I hear these um, when when I hear these scriptures about caves and being stuck in them, and just the lifeless, tormenting agony of being stuck in something that you are so desperate to get out of, I think of Isaiah 65:4, where where he says that the people were sitting among the graves, spending nights in secret places, eating the meat of pigs and putting polluted broth in, in their bowls. They were spending the night in secret places and sitting among the graves. I've been there. Chances are you've been there. Guess what? We weren't meant to stay there. We were never meant for the graves, y'all. We were never meant for the caves. We were never meant to die. We were made to live. We were made to thrive. We were made to have an intimate, personal relationship with our Creator, Father God. And we're not going to sit among those graves anymore. And we are going to be called out of those caves because we were never made for those. In fact, we were actually made for majesty. We were made for thrones. We were made for freedom. We were made for fullness. We were made for thrones. It says here in Revelation 3.21, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Romans 8, 17 says we are co-heirs with Christ. Guys, we were made for that. You were made to have a crown on your head. You were made for majesty because you are children of God. And I'm just thrilled that he's calling us out of our caves this morning and commissioning us into the city. I'm going to finish up with Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. Uh, this right here, I feel like, is, uh, is this man's testimony that we just read about. And this very well may be your testimony as well. Psalm 16, 9 through 11 says, No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. He won't let you stay there. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. So guys, be encouraged that God sees you in your cave and he hears you crying out from the cave and he has a plan for you. He's heard those cries and just as he saved this man in this Bible, he is saving us. He has a process for us. He has a plan for us and he has a purpose for us. So I love you so much and I hope that you have a fantastic Sunday. Bye-bye.